Welcome to the WN Legal Podcast. Welcome to WN Legal's next podcast. My name is Amy and I am one of the solicitors at the firm. Together with me, I've got Kyron, the director of WN Legal, and also Paul Holly from Evolve Wealth Management. Now, Paul is joining us today to discuss um, a more financial planning aspect towards financial and property settlements um, in family law matters. So welcome, Paul, and thank you for coming. Thanks very much, Amy, and glad to be here. Beautiful. So today's podcast will... Uh, Kyron will be taking the reins today and he'll be discussing the way in which the family court and I suppose um, you know practitioners in general deal with um, how property assets are to be distributed, who's entitled to what and um, what steps we should implement to try and get the best possible results for the clients. Now, before we start, I just need to read out a general disclaimer. So this podcast is a general discussion about the areas of law that we practice in that the public may be interested in. This podcast should not be taken as a substitute for legal advice or financial planning advice whatsoever, as each case is different. Until such time as we have properly evaluated your personal circumstances, we are unable to determine an appropriate tailored plan to your specific needs. So I will now hand over to Kyron, who will give us a bit of an intro as to the topic today. Yeah, thank you, Amy. Um, Well, in discussing our podcast today, I'll get straight uh, to the point. The Family Court looks at a four-stage process when determining uh, property entitlements and and what each party is entitled to. Um, The first step is always to determine what the net asset value is of the property pool. Um, In determining what type of property is included in in the evaluation, we'd probably be looking at all your assets um, and determining firstly whether you you are in a marriage or whether you're in a de facto type relationship. Um, In Western Australia specifically, uh, just for example, superannuation is not determined to be a property asset that can be split between the parties. In fact, it is only uh, determined to be a financial resource, uh, which would over, would which would have a bearing in the overall property uh, split, but cannot be split per se. All right. Now, w- once we have established what the asset pool is of the relationship, so we would arrive at a figure. Um, we will use a hypothetical figure for the purpose of this podcast. So let's say um, we've got a net asset pool of three hundred thousand uh, dollars for the purposes of our demonstration. Um, the next step we would normally uh, go through with our clients at the initial consultation would be to then move on to what we call financial contributions. Um, that is always the second step that the family court takes into account. And, and what we do is we evaluate, d- dependent on the, the income between perhaps the husband and wife or, or the partners of the relationship, we will determine who is the higher income earner. We will determine who perhaps has received a gift or inheritance towards the relationship. Um, we will also determine initial contributions and, and then sort of associate percentages with that aspect or step. The next step is, is uh, to look at the non-financial contributions that both parties have taken into account uh, or, or contributed to the relationship. That always involves, um, you know, who's been the primary carer of the children, you know, who who's basically done the gardening, cleaning around the house, cooking, all those aspects. Um, the court takes into account to determine what's a just and equitable split between the parties, mm-hmm. um, and and then what we look at is is a is a, a next step, um, which we call the future needs. So. The family court, once they've determined the contribution aspect and the net asset pool and what's available to be to be distributed, they will then make an adjustment for what we call future needs. Now, that involves uh, taking into account earning capacity between the parties. Um, it will take into account your medical needs, your age disparity, uh, all those type of factors. Uh, will you be able to undertake full-time work, part-time work? Uh, do you have some form of disability? Um, these are all aspects that we would sit down with you and you, you tailor you know, the, your, your circumstances to determine what the entitlements would be. And ultimately, what we would do is um, sit back, because there's also another step that, that most people don't talk about, is, is determining as a whole, after we've done that evaluation, what is just and equitable. Um, so sometimes parties could be um, siphoning money out for gambling or on you know, other um, 
aspects of the relationship that we couldn't wouldn't consider to have benefited the relationship so in in doing that then we would be able to give you a rough estimate of what we expect the family court um, you know would do obviously that would be obviously tailored towards every uh, circumstance is different each case can have a different outcome um, and and that was that's the way we deal with things um, now after we have been able to determine your your entitlements and give you a range of what we expect you are entitled to the the next step is to go to a financial planner and we've got well, luckily we have Paul Holly from Evolve Wealth Management which is just uh, away, just in, in the opposite corridor to us and I highly recommend Paul we've dealt with him um, for quite a while now and I, I find that he's he's quite a knowledgeable person and I would definitely go to him personally uh, myself so Paul Paul would then be able to, to work with the entitlements that we have given to you and, and tailor a specific plan to determine will it be better for you to keep your super or perhaps is it better to sell an investment property that's going to be tailored towards your specific circumstances so what I'll do now is I'll um, put on Paul onto the podcast and, and get his um, his ideas and plans of how he deals with his clients to determine those steps. Thank you, Kyron. Um, when we're looking at any sort of financial planning for clients, we're always uh, assessing firstly, what are their goals? What sort of plan do we need to put in place? And within that plan, what sort of strategies um, and investments and um, products do we need to use to reach those goals? So generally with a couple, they have combined goals. So then if it gets to the stage where we're looking at separation, we need to look at the individual goals of each of, each, uh, of those individuals. Prior to doing that though, we need to look at the consequences of unwinding that combined plan. So more than likely there'd be assets in place, they already have, may have, have uh, their principal residence, investment property, they might have a share portfolio, and they might have super funds. And that super fund can be individual super funds, or they could have a self-managed super fund where they're both members of that self-managed super fund. So the first thing we need to look at is what are the consequences? You know, Will assets need to be sold down? Will debt need to be paid off? Is it a good time to be selling assets at the moment? If so, will there be capital gains tax consequences? Or will they have to take a loss? Will some of the debt need to be paid out partially or all of it? So those are the types, types of things we look at. So then if we're looking at an individual, um, in any sort of financial plan, cash flow is critical. So going from a, a couple to an individual, then we look at their individual cash flow to see what sort of income they're going to have coming in in their new arrangement as an individual, what sort of living expenses they're going to have, and will that be enough, or will they be drawing down off the capital that they have? If there is going to be surplus income, can we be investing that to build an asset for their future? Also, what often happens is one of the members of the couple likes to keep the principal residence. So if so, what are the consequences of that? Will they have to take on the debt if there's, if there's a mortgage tax attached to that? And can they afford, can they service that debt going forward? Firstly, can they get a loan for that debt? And secondly, can they service that debt going forward? Additionally, what is their plan to pay down that debt over time? Um, more than likely, if there's debt in place for the, for the couple, it will need to be restructured. Now also, we need to look at, you know, is one member of the couple prepared to take more super assets than the other? Um, and then therefore giving up their access to those assets until they are able to access those assets in superannuation. So if so, you know, are they going to get more assets allocated to them? What's the opportunity cost of that? One of the other things, some of the legal things to consider in financial planning is binding death benefit nominations on, on super funds. And that's something which is quite often overlooked in a separation and, and it's critical. Um, and also obviously changing wills going forward. Another thing is if they have insurance in place, generally that sh insurance is based upon you know, their goals and combined assets. So more than likely the insurance will need to be revisited and need, may need to be restructured. It may need to be increased or decreased, but it needs to be revisited. So one of the main things is just getting advice early. So it's very important to get the advice before you go and sell a property or make any um, decisions in regards to the assets because in that way you're making informed decisions rather than 
potentially going and selling an asset without knowing the consequences. For example, what I've seen in the past is if um, a principal residence gets sold and there might be debt on the investment property, the bank, unless um, they're advised beforehand, will go and pay off that investment debt, which means that there's consequences in fa as far as tax deductibility goes um, going forward. So those are the sort of things that need to be advised prior to any transactions being put in place. The other really important thing is working together. So having a team, a lawyer such as Chiron, giving you the legal advice, us as the financial planners, but also we work with accountants and also mortgage brokers. So we've got all those areas covered, so the advice is coordinated. So when we're providing that advice, you're getting the best advice from all the different angles. So, um, and everybody's in the loop as to what's happening. So they're probably um, some of the main things that need to be looked at. But everybody's circumstances is different, and as, as I mentioned, getting that advice early on in the piece is critical. Mm. Yeah, I think that's really true, Paul. And I think um, that was that in itself was extremely informative. And I, and I know Karen and I have um, some matters where we're dealing with quite a large asset pool. And I think generally, um, you know, and this obviously isn't the circumstances in every case, but generally one party is more financially savvy than the other, um, and knows maybe more about how they want to deal with the assets and, and has maybe uh, built a lot of that base asset pool themselves. Um, so the party that's possibly, and I don't mean to um, be generalising here, but possibly the mother who's been at home caring for children or, or something to that effect may not have as much uh, financial savviness as the other party. So that's where it's really imperative that before we actually go working out who's getting what, that you've actually got this financial you know, planning advice first. And that's not, not saying that that's only for large asset pools, for small asset pools as well. It's, it's um, really important that that happens first. So I think um, that was extremely informative. I'm not sure if Kyron has anything else to add in respect to Paul's comments. Well, look, I mean, without having a, an appropriate financial planner to assist us in our legal family law property matters, especially the big asset pools, you're just simply not getting the full picture. Um, and, and what we tend to find is people often have an idea of how they want to split their assets, but without having the appropriate financial advice, um, which may have potential implications such as CGT, capital gains tax, like Paul's mentioned, which they're not factoring in simply. And, and us as lawyers, we don't have the capability, well, as family lawyers, don't have the capability to give you that advice. So we we going off what we expect the court to do. Um, and giving you an idea of your range uh, of, of your entitlements, but we're not able to specifically tell you whether that's the best financial decision. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you very much for your time, Paul. It, it's most appreciated and very beneficial to us. Um, and we would like to conclude the podcast on that. So thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thanks, Paul.